Hey, this is uh, CJ 490 lecture number four, as I recall. <clears throat> so hopefully it will be up and on. <clears throat> you all know how my technical difficulties prowess is. Last time we were talking about the second chapter <clears throat> in your text on racial politics, disparities in the long run. <clears throat> so uh, I want to kind of finish up today <clears throat> on this particular chapter <clears throat> uh, because quite honestly it leads to a number of other areas uh, in your book text, all of which uh, <clears throat> fold back to the original issue of <clears throat> how race fits in to the criminal justice system, how it does or how it doesn't. <clears throat> and certainly over the last several years, uh, way since before this article was written way back in 1994, and that's by the way one of the reasons I, I would like to see a newer edition of this book, but maybe we will, uh, <clears throat> has significantly changed in the last uh, four years, really. <clears throat> because the issue has morphed from the so-called war on crime, which is a phrase that Republican politicians used in the 1990s, the 1980s and the 1990s, <clears throat> to uh, things like uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement to <clears throat> the mass incarceration debate to uh, <clears throat> now we're in the midst of <clears throat> something that they <clears throat> The big thing these days, of course, is the Me Too movement and sexual harassment, which surprisingly, at least at this point, is only focusing on white women being assaulted. <clears throat> and I'm curious as to when it's going to shift to the other side of the page, and that's probably closer than we might think. So, let's see, uh, <clears throat> let's see what happens. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> let's talk about the so-called war on crime, which is a natural uh, bleed over. <clears throat> from the Nixon administration's days back in the 70s, 70, 71, 72, when then Vice President Spiro Agnew ran on what was being called the law and order political <coughs> agenda. <coughs> and that is that we were in the midst of an ever rising crime wave and therefore the problem was we weren't arresting enough people. <clears throat> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <clears throat> that then morphed uh, into the war on crime, once more in the 1990s, in which uh, we have a basic theory that it's not who we arrest, it's how we arrest them. And what happens to them after we do, in other words, that perhaps we should keep them in prison longer and make the penalties harder and let them out less frequently, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, so, um, now things basically have changed and 
uh, quite frankly, uh, the war on crime also had the so-called longest war in our country's history, known as the war on drugs. <clears throat> originally announced way back in 1971 during the, no, excuse me, 1968 during the Nixon administration. So we've been fighting a war on drugs ever since. Uh, and what have we gained from it? Well, first of all, we should have learned from prohibition that grand social experiment, which for 12 years after, from 1920 to 1932 meant <clears throat> that the federal government's efforts at law enforcement were at uh, conquering demon rum or the illegal prohibition <laughs> of alcohol. Uh, and Quite frankly, it never looked at the real issue of demand, which was people in this country wanted to drink, and they were going to drink no matter what. The war on drugs never truly looked at the issue of demand, except during the first Nixon administration. Now, Nixon is not known as a liberal, right? But his first so-called drug czar, person over who was appointed, uh, hired in the government to oversee the war on drug and the various agencies, <clears throat> focused principally on rehabilitation <clears throat> and uh, the issue of getting people off of drugs rather than on. And that is interesting because it is the only time in our history that we have seen the number of addicts significantly drop. Why? Because clinics were being set up and federal money was being sent, spent <clears throat> on law enforcement, but also on the other half of it, and that is to get people, you know, to detox them and to send them into clinics. Once he left, the focus of the war on drugs went to drug enforcement, not drug rehabilitation. And the end result is that for the last 50 years, and the war on drugs is almost 50 years old now, we've had a simple policy. Arrest offenders, drug offenders, put them in jail, <clears throat> and the focus has been originally for dealers, uh, mass importers, and then of course in 1991 and 92, <clears throat> when the Drug Reform Act was passed by Congress, the emphasis shifted <clears throat> from the seller to the buyer, consumers the ones being hit by broad definitions of the phrase in the uh, Uniform Controlled Substance Act, speaking of delivery of a controlled substance. It used to be that was someone who was selling, you know, fair quantities. But delivery now is defined as anyone who has a certain amount of narcotics in their possession, whether they're selling or not, the phrase says intent to deliver. So in other words, you might think of it, of giving some to someone. You might think of selling some. It has nothing to do with whether you actually have or not. And that's a significant shift in, I think, analysis of the way people have been arrested for dealing and using narcotics. We talked last last period, as I recall, about the so-called crack epidemic, which swept uh, New York City and Chicago and some other large cities, <clears throat> and how the Black Caucus 
amazingly enough, along with the conservative crime hawks, I call them, passed these 1991 laws <clears throat> because of the view in the African American community that crack cocaine was targeting African American women in particular, mothers, etc. Did they come out with documents back a few years ago where they finally released what the CIA had actually imported crack cocaine? I can find that. I, I've never seen that before, like that, that our government actually hauled yeah, it. It's the subject of a movie. Yeah. Mm. But now, like, there's a movie last year, this past summer, right? Yeah, but they and apparently, like, those documents came But it out. is documented. Yeah. Yeah, this is one about Ray for Evans. That's what I've been hearing. Yes. Yeah. The dude from New York. I remember I seen it. On, it was this big crime thing. They were talking about his name, Ray for Evans, and the CIA. Had, Got him to sell the drugs, but he was to fund some kind of war that they was trying to do or something. And they ended up taking him to jail. Well, I mean, that's basically the premise of the more recent movie, right? Oh. Uh, <clears throat> basically, that the CIA set up with the Colombian drug cartels to import cocaine and make profit off of it so they could fund uh, various clandestine operations in Afghanistan and. Uh, other places. There is no question that the war on drugs, by never looking at demand but rather only trying to focus on supply, <clears throat> missed the central question. And as I've said last class period too, the central question always remains <clears throat> that the only way to deal with issue of addiction is somehow or another to reduce the number of people who want drugs. Because as the simple economic rule always has been, <clears throat> where there is a demand, there's going to be someone to supply or to take care of that demand. Someone's going to meet it. <clears throat> and thus it is that the original uh, drug cartel as set up by Pablo Escobar and his successors, <clears throat> Uh, the original Medellin drug cartel and the others that have followed all basically came with the realization that a plant grown commonly throughout South America, the coca plant, uh, was used by the indigenous people for thousands of years to deal with altitude sickness and others uh, could by simple chemistry, be transformed from uh, ground up leaves into cocaine. Basically, I think you mix it with uh, acid of some kind, and I'm not sure exactly the process. And even if I did, I wouldn't tell it to you because. <clears throat> <laughs> Well, that's, you understand what I'm saying. Um, I mean, you can buy almost every other kind of plant in the world, so why not people start growing coca plants in their backyard? <clears throat> anyway, I don't want to get into the chemical. It is basically a process which is not that difficult to do. And it leads to large-scale commercial-type facilities which can uh, process tons of coca leaves into tons of cocaine. <clears throat> and it is Colombia, which was one of the leading sites because they had a lot of jungle territory in it, where <clears throat> cocoa harvesting could be planted, coca plants could be planted on large scale harvested and processed without fear of government interference. So, the importation suddenly of large quantities of cheap cocaine into this country, which again transformed things, and of course our answer is to arrest those who are importing or go after the Escobars, go after the others, <clears throat> but we still never went after the demand. It was always saying, oh, well, the reason that people are abusing the drugs is because there's so many drugs. 
wrong side of the equation, in my opinion. It should always have been, let's see what we can do to reduce it. Now, uh, the drug trafficking issue, again, of cocaine, and also somewhat of heroin, but principally cocaine, <clears throat> basically meant that just like in prohibition, which created organized crime, the Al Capones and the Meyer Lanskys and all the rest that were involved in the bootleg traffic, <clears throat> the ability and the infrastructure needed to bring significant quantities of cocaine and heroin into this country creates its own organizations. Yes, we initially talk about uh, Colombia because that's where the longest battle went on, but uh, certainly the drug trafficking and uh, apparatus simply moved from Colombia, now it's in Guatemala and Nicaragua to some extent, no, Guatemala and Ecuador and Bolivia, but principally now in Guatemala, which has seen this entire country basically disintegrate around the drug trade and the drug gangs. And so things again changed. <clears throat> now, the war on crime, and I'm specifically speaking of after 1991 with the federal, the very harsh federal drug penalties and state laws, which also implied similar rules. Again, all focusing on the user. Let's put the user in jail. Then we won't have demand. Well, we know that hasn't worked very well. Uh, but the, the central issue raised by this now 20 year old article is have these policies uh, adversely affected the African American community as opposed to others. Uh, and you know, I think there's somewhat of a mixed bag there. Yes, particularly with the crack epidemic, it was focusing on African Americans. Why? Because that had been identified as the population most affected by this evil crack cocaine. <clears throat> crack cocaine, of course, then gets supplanted by meth or amphetamines, which, to be honest, have been with us all along. Um, indeed, uh, heavy use of amphetamines uh, in the 1960s and 70s, actively promoted by doctors as a weight loss medicine. Uh, of course it is. I know, because my mother was prescribed black beauties by her obstetrician as a means of weight control. And we always wondered why she was so full of energy and buzzing around. Well, it's because she was messed up all the time. <laughs> that <is really> funny. <laughs> That's not funny. Uh, no, it didn't last forever, but again, it was popular among suburban wives as a and prescribed by doctors. Now, guess what? Have doctors in more recent years been discovered as once again talking about addiction to controlled substances? You're right. The drug industry convinced doctors all across this country that we are a nation of wimps, that we should never be uncomfortable. And the issue of uncomfortable in this case means no pain. Something happens to you, it's going to hurt, then you're to be given a prescription that will ease that hurt, right? Uh, when you watch too much television, one of the things that you continually notice 
is a large number of ads of over-the-counter pain remedies, uh, which certainly go to extremes. Uh, what's the one currently? Uh, the big difference between uh, ibuprofen and its counterpart, uh, Aleve, and I don't know what the drug it, chemical compound is, but one is a 12-hour time release pill, and the others, of course, last four hours, the normal dose of ibuprofen, although you can buy time release versions of ibuprofen by prescription. What are they talking about? Well, so-and-so has to get up, and he's got a lot of things he has to do today, and uh, if he'd taken one leave, he wouldn't have had to every four hours take more pills for his, quote, back pain or whatever pain it is he says he has. I submit to you that we don't really have that much pain in most persons' lives that they have to take an NSAID or Tylenol all day long every day of the year. But that's what these ads are implying that we want to do. So it's only a natural progressive step, right? You go in uh, to the dentist and you uh, have to have a wisdom tooth extracted, which is a painful process. So what do you get for it? Hydrocodone. Hydrocodone. All right. Before they even pull yeah, it, they um, give you that. Give you it. No, they didn't give me a before you get before, before they pull my they didn't give me a bag. They started before. like taking you like before the yeah, before before, it, before you yeah. before I took my kids and put it with some cheese. I had to get some of my hands on my foot. So here we are once again. Doctors saying it's going to hurt. So here's heavy pills. You take to mask the pain, so, and, and then you're given. Uh, Let's make him a Valium before they went. They didn't give me one. Yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get one when I had mine done either, but. I I even before he had mine, they give me drugs. All I was told was to take uh, aspirin or something. I didn't think it was Anyway, bad. all I'm saying is that the emphasis shifted again to what the pill manufacturers called pain management. Pain management means that no one should suffer pain of any type. Well, uh, so here we are having doctors prescribing millions of narcotics, pills, to people in various targeted areas. Uh, like ecstasy. Ecstasy was made in 1985 and it was made for therapeutic reasons. It was made for mm -hmm. women that had uh, been sexually assaulted. Isn't that true? Yeah. Mm. Look it up. I don't know. 1985. If you start looking again at the number of things that can, but for instance, Oxycontin, which is synthetic heroin. Oxy, excuse me. Oxycontin, synthetic heroin, sold to the medical profession as in in things which you can see the ads that ran uh, less than one percent less than one percent less than one percent addiction rate uh, no long-term effects uh, just you know evens out pain medications pills they all knew different than that they knew what it was they were selling and then uh, three years ago or four years ago, the medical profession, excuse me, or the pill makers get Congress to, or get the FDA to allow them to sell not just hydrocodone, but the strict product uh, without anything to cut it with. In other words, no Tylenol in it, right? Yep. On the view More that, down. hey, it, it gives you a bigger pain management request. It just means you get hooked higher. What's so funny about that one percent? I was written in an article by one gentleman, and the art and like it was in one paragraph. Like that was well, it was this one guy that claimed that in one paragraph of about twenty sentences, and everybody took off with it, the one percent. That's because they went to what they wanted to hear. That's they wanted to hear. It's, it's what they wanted to hear, and what the drug companies wanted doctors to hear, mm -hmm. because they wanted to sell pills. 
Because they're the kickback. chief manufacturers of Oxycontin, and basically three companies have made tens of billions of dollars selling those pills. And so you have at least two small West Virginia towns, uh, Kermit, which has a population of 360, and what's the other one over near Huntington? Uh, I was just hearing about it the other day. Why? Uh, I can't remember. Had 200 people in it. Anyway, two and a half million Oxycontin prescriptions filled. In a town of 360 people. Well, that's because, like, there was, during that era, in that time frame, like, there was so many rules and laws where people getting prescriptions filled. People found these little mom and pop stores that would push them. And that's, right. what, and, and that's like, so, like, the, the pills that were distributed in this particular, you know, I know, I used to go pick them up there. Like, we didn't even live there. You know what I mean? But it was just, it was people, they were cash cows. You roll up, you hand them $400, and you walk out the door with script. And that's how those places, because not every, like if you, the higher grade of pharmacy, the more likely they are to, to not well, take prescription. Well, what I'm talking about though is that it should be somewhat, it should have been more than suspicious. Oh, yeah. Since records are being kept of these prescriptions, that certain small places, certain communities were selling unreasonable amounts of narcotics. Well, and I'm not going to call them pills, they're narcotics, they're drugs. So, uh, once again, we end up having active collusion between the manufacturers of the narcotics and the doctors who are writing the script prescriptions for those narcotics. And what's the difference between that doctor and a heroin pusher? Well, I remember one point time, like when you'd go to routes to Florida, they had billboard signs that were like, if you're from West Virginia, take your ass back home. You know what I mean? Because people were driving from West Virginia down to the pill mills that were in Florida, picking up the prescriptions and driving back. And they had billboard signs. I can't remember what they said, but they to tell them West Virginia, if you're, you know, take your ass back home. Like, because at that time frame, people were traveling so far down to Florida. Mm -hmm. Anyway, basically speaking, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, the so-called war on crime, as it in more recent times, at least here in southern Appalachia, where the process first really got out of control, as people learned that all they had to do was mash up an oxycotton pill, add a little water to it, or heat it up some, and you could shoot it up and have a hell of a, you know, it was a heroin high. So guess what? All of a sudden. Uh, what came to be called hillbilly heroin becomes popular because of what it is. Now, once again, who missed the boat? Which they're now trying to cure. It. Who missed the boat? The drug enforcement agents. That's who missed the boat. And, and I don't care what you say. Between the FDA and the Drug Enforcement Agency and whatever, they missed the boat on this issue of large amounts of legally prescribed pills being distributed in neighborhoods and addicting fat tens of thousands of people. And again, demand. See, they were creating, and in other words, I guess you could also say, here's an example of an artificial demand being created for money, and now we have to suffer the consequences of having an astounding 64,000 people die last year from drug overdoses. That's more people last year dying of, of an overdose than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. More people. Now, uh, war on crime, does it have certain racial overtones? Yes. And this article was written in 1994. There's no question that it does. You can look at your statistics. Uh, and, of course, the war on crime in this case is not just drugs. It's also uh, other arrests. Uh, and 
uh, you can take a look here at these uh, statistics from the UCR uh, about white and black arrests for various types of crimes. And it pretty much shows again that law enforcement in particular was heavily involved in racial profiling on the view that that's where the that's where crimes are being committed. Uh, on the view that that's who we should arrest for crimes. Uh, okay. Now, the main explanation is put forth in this chapter two: the war on drugs. There you are. The war on drugs is the main explanation for this crime. Despite the fact that blacks, during the time period that the author is talking about, didn't really commit any more crimes per se than whites, because white people being the larger percentage of the population committed more crimes, but they were being arrested and incarcerated at a far greater rate than whites. But between 85 and 89, and 76 and 91, particularly what we see is a doubling of the rest of blacks for drug offenses, white offenses, increase about a fourth. But uh, black arrest for drug offenses is about 200% increase. Until suddenly, more black people are being arrested, as you can see here on page 29, than white people for drugs. And the process continues, it has continued. Despite, again, my comments about the Appalachian uh, pain management uh, crisis. And, and I say that because one of the things that we certainly also have to look at is that West Virginia, unlike neighboring states, has one of the smallest black populations in the country. Less than 5%, 5, what is it, 5.2%, something like that. Of, of the population in West Virginia as well. So in West Virginia, the drug epidemic is not a black drug epidemic, as we were being told. It's a white person ep epidemic. Rural, poor, white people are the ones mostly caught up <coughs> in the current opioid crisis that we're seeing. I didn't say that blacks weren't, that there aren't arrests in the black community, but it's principally a white driven, now suburban white driven problem. And that's probably why we're seeing maybe more focus on the issue of some of these issues. Because again, law enforcement has for too long, I think, neglected to say that, wait a minute, uh, we pick on certain parts of, of our population because we think they're the main offenders and they should be the ones picked on, not vice versa. Uh, anyway, Are there other uh, factors which could uh, come into this issue of arrest? Uh, and I will confess that one of the big things is the issue of homicide. And that is, unfortunately, people in the African American community kill more of their fellow African Americans than do whites. I'm talking about percentage wise. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are higher, there's a higher arrest rate in the African American community, or demographically wise, for homicide convictions. 
but that's because, again, of this skewed uh, statistics, which you can see if you look at more of the UCR reports over the years. And I, I try not to sometimes get into too much of that, but uh, it is certainly an issue. However, does drug usage drive some of that? Absolutely. Now let's talk about the one city, for instance, in the United States that has had the highest increase in homicide rates in the last three years, Chicago. What is the basic reason in Chicago for this increase in homicides? The drug gangs. The gangs fighting among themselves for turf of who gets to sell heroin. In, you know, in, in this part of the city or in that part of the city. It's very much gang related. Uh, and what we're talking about here is that even with sometimes a high police presence, it still doesn't mean that you don't have cars to driving by the road spraying bullets from automatic weapons in the neighborhood shooting and killing the people even though they're not, uh, not aimed. So my answer uh, really is uh, to this whole question <clears throat> that uh, race does indeed play uh, a major part uh, race in the war on drugs plays a major part in the statistics we have seen regarding crime, etc. But particularly, once again, that what we have not seen in the issue of race, again, or the war on drugs, is that we're not dealing with, again, the issue of demand. Now they're talking about it, but until we see significant amounts of federal dollars being shifted into drug rehabilitation programs, then what we have today, which is a patchwork system, uh, don't mean to imply bad things, it's a patchwork system of rehabilitation networks that have basically been built up uh, to deal with the issue of addiction and getting people out of the addiction curse. But most of these have been set up and are funded not necessarily on a large scale. They're kind of local programs mostly. A lot of them are private too, so it makes it very hard for somebody with a drug addiction to right. get the help they need because a lot of them have to pay out of pocket for the survival and stuff like that. So let's just give them more drugs. Let's give them more drugs. Give them more drugs. But once again, that's an issue. Uh, and I always think of methadone clinics as a as a major uh, as a major flaw in how to deal with drug treatment. Of course, what is methadone? Mm -hmm. so a synthetic version of heroin. Huh? Now, they take them down in Tazewell and they go down and get their methadone and then they go out on the corner and they sell it for what they can get from the drugs that they have been used. And I watched it go in and out when I lived in Tazewell. For like, it took me like the first week to see what was going on when I was out there. They do. They just take it and flip it. Dose them and send them out on the road at 5 30 in the morning. Yep. Hey, I'm not. <laughs> you see, you all are just preaching to the choir. That being me. <laughs> all I'm saying is that we've never yet we put a band aid on. It's dealt the with the real issue, and the issue is why. How, why do you, do it again? how do you change the culture of our population from wanting <clears throat> to? Uh, dead and pain, wanting to, uh, not having to face, you know, issues in our lives or whatever. How do you change people's culture 
to stop wanting to take drugs and I can't answer that. There are professionals who deal much more with it than me. But you can't, though. You really can't. There's always going to be somebody with that need or that crazy nerve. Well, that's true. But well, there's always going to be those commercials where it says, you know, if you drink a Bud Light, you get to go play ping pong with Donald Schwarzenegger. Yeah. That's not where I'll call me to me. Yeah. Well, let me simply finish with one final ball. statement. For much of the uh, 60s and 70s until the early 80s, into the 80s, heroin usage was somewhat localized in large, several large cities, but principally in New York City. <clears throat> Other drugs were taking effect elsewhere in the country, but the number of heroin addicts actually was somewhat stable. Okay? We had other drugs, fads, and you had cocaine, and then you had crack, and then you went into meth. Why meth? Because people learned they could make it on their own, and it was damn cheap, right? Cheap, cheap to make. All you had to do is go buy a bunch of cold pills and uh, a little kerosene, a little kerosene, a little kerosene, a few other chemicals, and kerosene. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kerosene lye and mix it up. But there are no microwaves. I think the people catch yourself on fire. <laughs> like well, hard it's flat straight off their bone. Well, it's because <laughs> production of meth is a damn hazardous thing. It, you put out a toxic gas that allows. You know what Breaking Bad was about? That show? Breaking yeah. Bad mm -hmm. making meth. Making meth. Yeah. Anyway, today. Heroin is no longer confined into the inner cities of New York and Philadelphia or wherever, or Boston. It's now, as a result of us here in Appalachia, it's now all over the place. And uh, we'll talk more about some of those subjects, I think, next class time. We'll try to get... I'm going to try again. I'm, I'm bouncing around with chapters because uh, what is single chapters in this text is uh, yeah, we got 10 minutes left. Yes, the uh, legal research class is meeting in the library Yay. on the topics which I handed out last class. They just had a, another bad batch of heroin go through uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, where my brother lives. And he said it killed like three or four people in one, like within a matter of yeah. like four hours. All right. I'm going to close off for now. We're going to take more up on some of these subjects on the war on drugs, et cetera, in the next class period. I'm closing for now. This has been a rather short lecture, but it took me longer to set it up and get in here. And that's all.